Uh, hello, everybody. I, I hope you're still awake. Uh, it's been a tough night last night. Um, I will be talking today about some best practices, let's say like that. I call them 10 commandments of software engineer. If I will be walking like this and you know covering the slides, just shout out. I'll have the habit of walking around. Um, I'm a bit concerned because I've seen, I think, already two talks which have touched on, on, on similar things. So there will be a little bit of overlap, but maybe this will be another opportunity for you to kind of, you know, take some stuff of the talk. Um, like this. Right, so let me introduce myself first. I'm Sebastian Marek. Um, I'm Polish, but I've lived in the UK for the past seven years. Um, I'm very passionate if it comes to software quality and and best practicing a best practices in software engineering. Um, I dare to think that I'm actually a little bit better than what was actually told during the, the keynote today, so that I can still uh, develop and actually produce some code despite the fact that uh, I've been a technical architect at a company called Imis, which is uh, based in Leeds. And I actually have some publishing history and I wrote two books and I've been publishing in PHP Architect and I'm actually here speaking. Um, probably some of my work weights could disagree and stuff like that. I've been in development for over 12 years, that's probably more, I, I stopped counting the years and I've been doing all sorts of different stuff in all sorts of different languages. Uh, starting in the early, early years with C++ and Pascal and then do a little bit of Java and then finally ending up with scripting languages like PHP and Py, a little bit of Python. Um, I occasionally contribute to open source software. If I can, if I really find time, I find it as one of the ways that you can improve. I actually had uh, two conversations during the conference with two different kind of teams from two different companies about, you know, how can you improve and how can you take your team forward? And this is definitely one of the things that you can do. Just try to submit a small patch or do something with the open source. Uh, this will usually be a very good way of finding out what are the standards in software engineering and actually getting some pretty good feedback. It might sound scary at the very beginning um, because, yeah, we can't, we can't really hide it that some of the people are not really friendly if it comes to the feedback, but that's just interacting with other people. But please give it a try and you will see some differences. To explain the, the full plate armor, that's me actually in there with my daughter. In my free time, I'm really, uh, I'm really um, into castles and medieval times and things like that. But let's move on. What I want to do today um, is to achieve two things. First of all is to try to change a perception of being a software developer and change what you think of your job and what you're doing. So this probably is what most of the people think we do. We're just hacking some stuff. Um, uh, we're just typing some weird things into the consoles and producing some something amazing. We probably think we're badass hackers in here, like now multiple desktops doing all sorts of stuff while we actually like you know, uh, tackling the daily problems during development. Um, we probably think we, we're more like artists, or at least some of us are, and we actually create those beautiful things while we're really firefighting. And, and, and I'm trying, I will try to go through all sorts of things, why it might, what might be the reason why we're firefighting and things like this. Yeah, and probably our mom thinks that we're just playing Nothing else, that's what we do at our job. Uh, but what I want to do also, well, what I think is that we more like craftsmen. And that's what's been mentioned in the, in the keynote as well today about software craftsmanship. This is kind of a, um, a movement that has been around for, for a few years already, trying to more promote and educate people about what is needed to develop proper software and to treat it more like a craft. It's been a controversial topic because it depends how you look at this guy because he could be like doing all those small things manually all the time, that's not about that. It's more about the experience and the skills. So if you look at the blacksmith, for example, and, 
and how long a blacksmith as a profession has been on the market. It's been backed up by hundreds of years of experience and people learning and fathers passing the knowledge over to sons all over and all over again. And they basically mastered their profession. It's a bit different with software engineering. It's been actively as a profession probably for the past, what, 60, maybe 70 years. We didn't really have a lot of time to master our profession and to learn all the things that should be done properly. And this is kind of only emerging as probably the way you should, we should be doing. So back in the days there were guilds and people were like, you know, gathering together, making sure they all follow the same things, the same standards. But it's more about passing the knowledge over, making sure that everybody follows the same thing and then we can achieve beautiful things. Uh, also, there is a, you know, another part of that because there were some crappy craftsmen. And, and we have value products as well. So obviously creating something which is great and works very well, it costs money. You can't deny that. It's something that you need to put an effort and effort is time and time is money. So obviously the longer you spend developing something, the more it costs. But the end product, hopefully, should be better. So it kind of, there is a relation between money and the skills and the experience. So sometimes you have, a, you have a situation when you have to develop something really, really fast. And if the, there are valid reasons why you have to do it, you could kind of relate to it as it's being a, like, you know, Tesco value product, which it does what it says on the tin, it's probably not the very best. And it's got some horse meat in it. Um, so, what I want you to do today, I will be talking about 10 different things. Some of them have been already mentioned, but if you'd like to take two of them, at least two of them, when you come back to your workplaces and start trying to apply it to your daily job, that would be a success. Even at least think about it, whether this is something that could improve what you do. I will do it in a relation to a development cycle. There's a very high view of a development cycle where you, you, know, you initiate a project, you design it, then you implement that, and you test that, and then you, you know, hand over the project and you see what you've done. But it should be enough for what I will be talking today. So the first phase will be project initiation, and that's where everything starts. Thou shalt not disrupt the legacy system. There's been a brilliant talk today about legacy systems. I think Michael Peacock, um, it was about refactoring to symphony components. And he actually told the story how they went from starting a project which was basically dealing with a very legacy system, which was pretty old and really, uh, really, um, really hard to maintain. And they've dealt with all sorts of different problems, like, you know, the project was using obsolete technology. They couldn't really cope with that very well. It costs a lot of money to maintain that. Um, and just because nobody understands, there obviously is no documentation. Whenever they've changed it over time, uh, nobody bothered to put any sort of notes or, or, or create some, or, you know, document something how it is supposed to work and things like that. So it was quite a challenge. The problem with legacy systems is usually that they're very, very important for the business. Uh, developers hate them, the business loves them, they deliver the business value. So it's not an easy decision to, to go and say, let's just rewrite that, right? Because we want to use all those cool new features and everything. Um, because the, the risks that are there that you might not know the full scope of the requirements that were initially put there, they've changed over time, and so and so and so. And then the end product will be probably, or most probably, very far from perfect. But there is a way to do it, and actually Michael have already talked about it, and what you, what you can do to actually tackle that. So he was talking about the project that uh, was roughly about size of WordPress, and he said they've had a team of, I don't know, three or four developers working on it, on it probably for four months just to get it rewritten, or rewritten, extract the business logic and replace the application tier, basically. That was the idea. 
Uh, but he mentioned a lot of those techniques that you can use if you know you start your project, you know your requirements, you probably want to improve and things like that. So some of the things you can do is to you know to start extract the things without changing. This is a very crucial thing. Don't try to amend the system that you're refactoring. Refactoring is not rewriting. It's changing the way it is implemented. It's not the way. It's not changing the way it works. And the way you can do it, you can, you can basically hopefully take some part of the logic, of the business logic at least, to take it away, uh, hide it be behind you know, a nicely defined interface which self-documents the behaviors and just black box it, you know, close it there. You know, we kind of know what it does. It's, it's been working like that for, for years. Um, so hopefully that whole black box will do what it was supposed to do before. What you're achieving is that you can start pulling stuff out from that black box and, and you know, slowly refactoring, still maintaining the same functionality. Though shall document early and while thy mind is fresh. And this is what developers are really crap at. And just because we can't really well express what we think, and to be honest, we usually, um, we usually prefer to code and do the cool stuff instead of doing this boring, uh, boring documentation thing. But there is a way to, to, you know, to still do it without affecting your job with all the benefits that come from it. And the first thing of it, well, we've had several um, concepts about uh, development techniques. So let's call it documentation-driven development. And this is something that you start and try to, to document what you will be, at least roughly, in very high concepts, what you will be developing. And it could start with the requirements, obviously, and at least specifying what you're trying to achieve and what is the main business goal. This is something people usually forget. They more focus on the scope and, uh, and specific features. It less, uh, instead of actually saying what the business is going to get out of that. Um, there is also the, the, other, the other layer of the documentation, which is the developer's documentation, and I'm talking about specifically documenting APIs or all the libraries that you might be using during, uh, during development. And, and yes, it's as easy as using PHP document to providing that you, you, know, you use all those um, annotation in your code and then you can use it to pass it and just you know spit it out on the other side so there is not a lot of effort going into that but that's not enough simply because it only gives you a high level overview of the api and then imagine it's quite a big api and you've got a lot of different features now how you use that that's something that you can document on top of that and what i found very useful is trying to back up this automated created documentation with some examples at the very early design stage. Hopefully you have a design stage when you're developing something. Um, and this is more about right now we're developing this library or all the system which is supposed to work like that or whether it's an API which is going to be exposed. It's going to do that then and that and give some examples how you're going to use this API. Yes I know code should be self-explanatory and you should have a look at you know, that API name and the parameters should roughly tell you what this needs to be used for. But the problem with some of the implementations are that there is a lot of ways to achieve the same thing and unfortunately not all of them are the right ones. Or not at least that you can achieve the same thing um, as, quick, as quickly and um, and with the same efficiency as it was designed. So those notes really will help a lot. And on top of that, things like, you know, the product is rarely finished. There is, al there is always a bit of field there to, to improve it. And if you know it can be improved and how it can be improved, putting some hints and tips around like, you know, I've done this, but you could take it a little bit further and do something like this for it. So feel free to, to, to reuse my concept because otherwise you're going to find out after half a year or a year 
with those two new developers joining their own company, they completely weren't aware of the concept and completely misunderstood the way it was supposed to work. Then this documentation is, is, is something obvious, but why it's important mainly because you can avoid situations where you get a call from a customer saying that doesn't work. But he didn't know that it wasn't scoped or that feature wasn't supposed to exist there. Or maybe something else failed there and they weren't trained properly and they're trying to do something that they're not supposed to do. So, and it doesn't matter whether it is an internal project and you're using this as an internal system or it is external, the, the, the challenges and the problems are exactly the same. And this is something more soft and this is still at the stage where we're trying to, you know, to create the specification or, or to formalize all the requirements. So this is those should speak up early and often and be very clear about it, open and honest. And this is another thing that we suck at. Just as was already told that we, we tend to, you know, to isolate ourselves and not talk to the other humans. And, um, but this is important mainly because you can solve many problems at the very early stage. One problem coming with the communication thing is that we, some of us at least, tend to do too many jobs at the same time, forgetting what is our role. So we are the developers, so we're coding, but we are also trying to be a project manager and start to making decisions. This is not what you, what you were to do at the project. And this is one of the common mistakes. You, you're assuming things that might not be correct. That's what the project managers are out there, as much as we hate them. And that's what the project owners are there to actually confirm and put the things in place. So try to stick to your domain of, of kind of a decision making place and make a decision about how you're going to some, implement something, not whether you should you know, implement the feature or not. Um, and there is a way to to make it work because if you start communicating very early and once you spot the problem, it's going to solve a lot of problems. Simply because um, you set up the expectation at the very early stage so the decision can be made very, very quickly and hopefully it will not affect the deadlines and how you develop stuff. Um, the last thing which is kind of important for me, and I've kind of faced it several times, it's, it's the no decision versus best, bad decision thing. And I strongly believe if you made a if you're about to make a decision, just made it, make it. Um, because, you know, living it on the side, shuffling under the carpet is not going to help. It's just going to make it all things works. I know that some of this stuff is not, is completely beyond us and it's more on the management level and things like that, but this is something we need to aim for to make sure that we don't you know, hang out in the middle of something not knowing what's gonna happen to next. So I'd rather have a decision than just waiting for something that might never happen. So we know what we're doing. Well, we know what business wants us to do. So hopefully you can get to the point where you can create some technical documentation or at least some guidelines for the developers um, how to implement it from the technical point of view. Design not for complexity but for simplicity and wherever the beast named complex show really its ugly head, smithed it with thy sword named modular and let no module be known by the name of the beast. Um, I think that says it all. You can do this and you can do this, both works, right? Now imagine you just joined the company and you're seeing this. Over-engineering is one thing, well there's nothing about over-engineering, that's just a mess. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to talk more about over-engineering and this is something which, which I think most of us have experienced and myself as well and this is something that we tend to often forget and we try to plan for the future. And this is kind of coming back again to the requirements and making sure you're performing your role. Don't try to be clever than the project owner or the customer. Don't try to assume things 
it's rather go to them and speak to them and get it out of them before you make a decision. A good example would be, I don't know, can you get this report, pass it and save it to the database? And then, you know, what comes out of the other side is suddenly you get it posted on Twitter because it's cool because I've just seen this API, things like that. It's a very extreme example, but it's, I'd rather follow the path of develop a very simple solution for the problem you have but be flexible in a way that you can extend it in the future. It could be achieved by, I don't know, introducing interfaces, make it like a pluginable. But please don't deliver all those other parts that are not needed. That's where you waste the time and that's where you make the other people confusing. Because then you come back to that and think, were they ever a requirement to do this and this? Because the code is there, it's probably never executed, so why it was developed in the first place at all? Convention over configuration design paradigm, which is something that people talk a lot as well. And if you have not heard about it, it's more about, you know, don't try to make everything configurable. Rather stick some guidelines and conventions around how things should be done. And not in this one project that you're working with, across the whole thing. The benefits are going to be very, very, uh, it's gonna be, they're going to be visible very, very quickly because uh, you, you will find yourself intuitively doing things because you will know how it is going to work. And this is all around not the processes, but the naming conventions and everything. I can't recall the project that I was using, but it could have been Guzzle PHP or something like this, I don't remember. But I only read like a very quick start guide to use a library. I just knocked it up and then I wanted to, you know, to do some more things about it. And most of the time I could have guessed the name of the function that was you know, supposed to deliver the thing and probably about 90% of the times I was right without even needing to actually, the need to look at the documentation. Um, I think Albert Einstein said it, uh, said it once that uh, make everything as simple as possible but not simpler. This, this is actually summarizing it very, very well. Which leads me to the will thingy. Thou shalt not reinvent the will. It's been said during this conference so many times. But this is not all about frameworks. Sometimes there might be a valid reason to, to write something from the scratch. But what I more want to talk about is the implications. Because this is, this is being you know, overlooked a lot of times. And this is about the support. This is about the time you're investing into writing that. And, and the benefits that come out of it. So now, in-house frameworks, probably every company I worked for, there was one or two attempts to write another framework. For God knows reason why. Um, I know, like, if you look back, I don't know, five, ten years ago, there wasn't a lot of frameworks. Uh, but there was, like, I don't know how many of you remember something called PHP Lib? One, two, you remember? <laughs> um, but it was an example of trying to solve a problem. How crappy the implementation was, it still was something that you could use. At the time, it was well supported and it delivered the functionality. Um, so think twice before you start to write the framework, another one, and think instead whether you can change the way the existing framework works. Try to, you know, um, Try to talk to the, community, to, to the community that supports the framework and see whether you can change something. If you, if you find a problem, go and fix it. If you don't like it, I don't know, submit a request for, for a change or, or describe what you want to achieve and try to achieve it as a community, as a group. Otherwise, you first of all spend a lot of time developing the new thing, which is most probably going to be months, and hopefully it will be more than one person if you ever do it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with framework being written by one person with no documentation and nobody knows how it works. And it's probably very crappy implementation anyway. Then you've got another things around supported. So obviously now you've got your shiny new framework, which is so much better that was already on the market. And then you start, actually, that's buggy. 
and we actually didn't bother to write the unit test, so whenever we change it, it actually breaks here, there, and there. And then you need to actually spend your valuable resources to actually supporting something that doesn't bring the, the direct benefit for the company. <coughs> and then you've got the training factor, because now, well, this could happen as well. The guy who wrote your framework now left. There is no documentation, and now you've got two rookies coming in, and they have to use it. Good luck. Um, so we've designed it. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We used one of the frameworks were supported. We got the documentation. We know what we're doing. We know the tools. Now we go into the implementation. Thou shalt commit often, and your messages shall be informative. I'm really impressed by uh, hearing at the keynote that the guy said that he's committing like 200 times a day. That's impressive. You think? <laughs> it was very, very hard to say which bits were sarcastic and which not. <laughs> so let's say I'm, I'm, impre I'm impressed if it was 200. I, I'm not that good, but what I, I would encourage you to, to more look into developing what you're doing in small pieces that could be deployable and they, they, they would work and, and that you could commit very frequently. Uh, probably once an hour, a little bit more, that'd be good. Please avoid the situation when you commit once a day or once a two days or once a week because you've got it yeah, on this USB stick and then you can, you can do it. The right tool for the job is very important. I'm not sure whether how many of you actually spotted this, uh, this blog post about please don't use Git, it sucks. And about being as sarcastic as the keynote was today. Um, but it's not about forcing everybody to use Git. There's been a lot of you know, uh, noise around that. Although I would say use Git. Um, but this is simply something that I've done before and we actually have used. I, I still remember the times when we were using CVS for version control and when we realized it was a really, really um, not great tool to use. And we actually identified that it's actually slowing us down. This is one of the reasons we've got delays, um, that we've got problems when we are merging, and, and this kind of you know, scale as your development team scales. Uh, so please have a look back, and as we did, we had a look back and see what we can do about it. It was a big change. We had like a gig sized co code base, which was all over the place, and it wasn't easy to actually migrate it over to Git. Uh, although we did not make a decision about where we want to go, we more investigate what are the options. So obviously it was like probably about six years ago. The obvious choice was subversion. But then we looked at subversion as, yeah, it's CVS on drugs. It doesn't do really much more. It solves some of the major problems that CVS has got, but it still develops the same concepts. And then we look at the... the um, the other uh, version control systems, we look at Git. There was quite a risk because at the time it wasn't actually uh, used that much, but we thought that it's going to solve our problem, and it did, and it works brilliantly. Uh, so we talked about commit frequency. Now I'm going to talk about commit verbosity. I was going to use some of the examples from, um, from some of the code bases I've had, but in the meantime, I have found actually something else, and I think it's going to be so much better which is called commit logs from last night. I'm not sure whether you have seen it before. Right? Let's start with that. I could go on and on and on and on with that, right? I think this is something around swear words in that because I have not found a one, this is actually coming from GitHub, so th this is a really good example. But what I'm going to talk about is more about, yeah, this is funny. This is funny when you read it now. Is this your, if this is your code and you have to fix a problem, that, yeah, shitty worker, uh, yeah. So there is a lot of things that you can do to, to make your life easier and not harder by doing this stuff. I know you could have got like a very bad day and you have seen this shitty code so many times and you want to fix it, but this is not helping out at all. So I'm actually gonna, gonna skip the examples that I've got 
Um, this is a little bit more verbal, but still, you know, I know, expand on comment is one that I basically love, or this is the thing that I'm getting all the time fixed. <laughs> Way! Thank you. Um, what I want to see is more something like this. Yes, I fixed something, this is what I fixed. I can refer to something and see what it is, whether it's a bug or whether it's a requirement or some bit of documentation where I can go and look what it is. And then actually, you know, this is what Git actually allows you to do as well. So we've got like, you know, a very short command and you can expand it and so on and you can see. I'm not telling you to write stories and novels and everything like this, but at least summarize something what you have, what you've been trying to achieve and what you have actually done. And try to commit things in batches, but in small batches. So I've been working with a, with a company recently which we told them to deliver a piece of functionality. There was like 17 requirements around the system. So they weren't, some of them were related, some they weren't. What we got back? One commit. Brilliant guys, thanks. And it was saying, yeah, deliver this, deliver this, deliver this, deliver this, and it now works. Thank you. Uh, so please try to, you know, to, to separate the functionality that you're writing simply because, I don't know, you might want to remove something because it's not been delivered to standards and it just doesn't work and you don't want to delay your release. We've got 15 minutes and we are at the seven, so we're not going back. Those shall not kill maintainability. Coding standards, the code under control and, and, and general maintenance and making sure that what you're working with is not stopping you doing your job. So the coding standard thing is very, it's another um, very controversial thing. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, I tend to think when your team grows is very important. Specifically, if you have multiple teams working from different locations, it quickly becomes a mess. So, I don't know, this is another example from my past experience when we're saying, guys, we need this, this is our coding standards, please stick to it. No, why would you? And, and we were saying that there was like, oh, yeah, but we have to do this and it's gonna take more time, blah, 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 blah. You've got things like PHP code fix, I'm not sure whether you've heard about it, where you can actually stick to one standard and, and you know, fix the code immediately. So it saves a lot of time. But it's all about following one standard. These are the guidelines, this is this thing around the craftsmanship which everybody does in a, in a consistent way so everybody else when, it, when they join know how to follow. Size and complexity, this is all around all different tools that you can actually look at your code. Just make sure that you don't, you know, write classes and methods that have got like 6,000 lines of code. That's, that's a brilliant experience. So please keep them under control, make sure that you structure them well. Again, the single, um, what was the paradigm called? Uh, single, uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, and make sure he does the one thing that it is supposed to do. So don't write a class that sends an email, tweets, and passes a file, and, and all sort of, I've seen these things as well. Um, complexity is the same thing. Um, you've got tools like PHP Depend and PHP Master Tutorial and PHP that can actually analyze all sort of decision paths in your code and telling you how much complex it is. And it's not a rocket science that having a, a function with, I don't know, 12 or 50 if statement is not gonna make it easier to understand what it does. And finally, you remove that code. So whenever you see something that you know it's not being used, remove it. It's a source control. You can come back to it. You don't have to comment it out and tell me that we don't use it anymore. No. Just remove it and get rid of it. And whether it's a part of the code, if it's important, tell me that in the commit message so I can refer back to it. How am I supposed to find it anyway when it's gone? Uh, you could grab and you can, I don't know, um, try to, you, you know, to find by some keywords, but it only makes it messier to read it and stuff like that. And the same applies to, you know, to all the files that you're not using anymore, whether it's some, you know, 
things that you import in or you, you just remove the whole module from your code base, just remove it, don't comment it out. Thou shalt not repeat yourself. Um, that's about copy-pasting and, and cloning and the temptation to do it right. And, um, and it's, not that, it's not that hard. Um, all you have to be aware of the risks. Um, and while at, you know, at the first sight it might seem to be a very good solution, just, yeah, we've done it here, just copy-paste it there, and then another one comes, we copy-paste it there, and then we're going to pick up which version, and then you start having problems with it, and then they change it there, but they forgot here and there, and probably there, 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 in there. And then how are you supposed to you know, debug it and see what the problem is, and how you're going to find all the patches and things like that. So it's easy to say now, it's, it's much harder when you already work the system which has been affected by this clone mutation thing. But not everything is lost. There are some tools that can help you out to detect some of the, uh, some of the duplication and to get it under control. Uh, first and very easy solution is to use PHP copy-paste detector, which is basically tokenizing your code and try to find some similar patterns and, um, uh, and basically tell you which files or which functions or which piece of code are basically copied and then you can have a look at this and, and sort it out. If you want to go a little bit further and get some better results, there is a tool called Sona, which has got a brilliant duplication detection engine. And it's not only within one project, this is a continuous inspection tool, which basically does a static analysis of your code, but it can also do it cross-project, which is brilliant. And then you can extract it nicely into a module, file, wh whatever you want to do, it just have it in one place. So, um, Quickly going into testing, we've got the stuff that we needed to do. We need to confirm that it works. Fear not the priest of quality assurance, nor the altar of testability, though they be stained with the blood of thy brethren. For they are the salvation of the righteous and the servants of our Lord, the customer. QA is important, but QA is important from the start. So this is, I think, one of the most mistakes on misunderstanding of the QA phase. QA phase is more like an acceptance phase. So you already know you delivered your requirements, you already know it works, it's the verification and it should be more the verification before the customer receives the product. So, first of all, automate that quickly, Selenium, Behat, whatever you're using, just don't do those manual, repeatable operations all over again, all over again. You're gonna, um, you're wasting so much time and you're gonna save so much time if you just keep it automated. Unit test, and this is not the next development, um, it's not the next phase of your development cycle. It's part of development. It's not I write code and then later on I might write the unit test. You do it as one exercise. Functional test I mentioned already. CI, obviously that's gonna help you out a lot. Make sure that it all comes together if, if you think about it. You commit frequently, you integrate it into one, you shove it into CI, you run your test, you've got the whole engine running all over, giving you all the feedback and information about how you're doing. It's really, really simple. And a little bit about ownership and responsibility around this stage. A lot of those problems can be fixed if you take care of what you do and if you and if you start owning that piece of functionality that you've been developing and you're not shoving it on the carpet, yeah, the simple bugs, we're not doing it now. No, raise it. You don't have to fix it. That's not your decision to make. Just make sure that everybody is aware, especially your project manager and the project owner, they make decision whether you, they want to fix the bug or not and not just deny it and just you know, pretend it's never been there. Um, as a reminder, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this graph, and this is about the costs of fixing a bug at the requirement stage, design, coding, and then acceptance and things. It just dramatically goes up, just because if you're at the acceptance stage, or, or actually it's, you know, it's already on production, if you made a simple design mistake, which basically negates what you're doing, you know, it's gonna cost you a lot of money if you want to fix it properly and not hack it. So now we're getting to the closure. 
uh, project handover and actually looking back what you've done. Those should recognize and retain your top talent. It's quickly because we've got five minutes. Um, this is more about taking care of your people and um, appreciating the the effort that has been put into delivering something. That's probably not kind of taken in, uh, not aimed at you at all. That's probably more into those project managers and maybe company owners that are hiding here somewhere. But it's what I want to really mention is something I call people gardening, and which I call about those good people which grow and and deliver the, and the, deliver the. Uh, the things that, uh, that we want them to deliver, and people that stop you down and slow you down, and I, I refer them to as weeds, and you have to get rid of the weeds as soon as possible because they're gonna spread around and they're gonna just make everybody lives harder. I know it sounds very, very cruel, but from my experience, I'd rather say, you know, make an attempt to get them back into the right tracks and to working together and we are the people, but if it doesn't work, you're really making a mistake by leaving the, the, you know, the not efficient people or not the people that don't follow the standards on board. They're gonna lower the morale, everybody's gonna be looking back at them and saying whether, why do I have to do something if they don't? Why? And there is nothing actually, you know, making them to do that, so. Um, and the good people, the fertilizers, they're gonna just, you know, spread, they're gonna spread the knowledge, they're gonna spread the, the good mood and everything, and they're gonna you know, just improve what you do on a daily basis. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna come back actually to the keynote again, because I'm still trying to get my head around what was, what was the conclusion. And I hope I know, I, 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 it was a brilliant conclusion in terms that yes, we have to be focused on the, um, on the end goal and not actually on the tools. The tools should be the background, they should be completely invisible, the practices should be like, you know, something that we do and not what we are forced to do. And, and it's great to have this, you know, great piece of engineering there and that the whole team worked for a very long time but I'm not so sure whether it's been done because they have not the tools. And I dare to say they didn't have the tools because that happened. <laughs> and that happened. I was actually trying to have a look at some of the statistics uh, and see actually how the whole you know, space program looked like and looked how many launches there were and how many failures and stuff like this. So what I've been able to find was 150 35 launches, I think, successful launches. So we've had two fatalities, well, in terms of the space shuttle was lost. There's been a number of cancellations and mainly driven by all those accidents and everything. So really, no, they work in exactly the same environment, just the implications are much more severe. So I think they probably get into, I'd like to, I'm not sure how to get this information, but it would be good to see actually what they are doing in terms of getting back on track, because obviously there's been some problems and some, you know, they overlooked things that actually led to a complete disaster. If you want to read a little bit more about, you know, principles and things like that, some of the stuff I actually uh, like kind of borrowed. So we've got like a principles about software engineering, software quality, egoless programming. This is about the soft side. And if you want to read a little bit more about, see at the logs from last night and go have a look at that. Coming back a little bit quickly into software craftsmanship. Um, if you don't know the guy, Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob, called by the people, he's like a, um, he's promoting the whole idea of craftsmanship in software engineering. And, and I can, wholeheartedly recommend you those two books, really, really brilliant uh, books talking about um, you know, the best practices, what you can do to improve, how you can make it all work. He's all around the agile and everything like this, and then you've got the feelings around what he thinks about stuff. He's got a cleancoders.com site where he's posting a videos talking about the, the clean and, and proper engineering um, 
uh, principles and things like that. Really, really cool to watch with a little bit of a humor and everything like this. There is a manifesto about software craftsmanship and something that's been already mentioned about katas. So, you know, practicing, um, practicing uh, uh, frequently the same operations all over again. I don't think we have a, a time for questions. You can find me on Twitter. This is my Twitter handle. So ask me questions or engage me after the talk. Thank you very much.